Hey everyone, this is Sellers. And this is Stormy. And And this this is is Unforgotten. Unforgotten. Where each episode will highlight unsolved missing, murdered, and suspicious death cases in Alabama in order to raise awareness and hopefully obtain some answers for victims and their families. Please remember that any individual referenced in the podcast should be considered innocent until found guilty in a court of law, and any opinions or views expressed in the podcast are solely those of participants. Listener discretion is advised as some of the content discussed in the podcast may contain violence or graphic descriptions and may not be suitable for all audiences. Hey guys, thanks for joining us on our very first podcast episode today. Stormy? Ooh, can you believe it? How you feeling? Oh, we were a little nervous to start with, but I think we got it, don't you? It took a little while, but I think we're settling in. Me too. I got a joke for you. Where is a cat's favorite place to vacation? Oh, boy. I don't know. The Meowtons. Oh, I know. (laughs) I love it. I love your dad jokes. Or mom jokes. I don't know. (laughs) So we've gotten a couple of comments about podcasts and did we have one? And if we did, where could people listen? And to start off with, we didn't have a podcast, obviously, because... Here we are with the first episode. But we kind of went back and forth with whether or not that was something that we wanted to do and take on. And it takes a lot of work. And then we decided, you know what, why not? Because not everybody has social media. Not everybody has time to stop and read all about these cases like what we're doing. So, right. Yeah. You know, why not put it into a format where somebody can listen to it, whether you're in the car or cooking dinner, hanging out at the house. Some people just like to listen to things, kind of like listening to an audio book, you know. So, right. I'm the same way. I mean, I'm totally the same way. I like will listen when I'm in bed at night before I go to sleep or in the car when I'm going somewhere. So it's a lot easier than pulling open something to read, you know. I that I like listening whenever, you know, I'm driving. I'll listen mm-hmm. to a podcast a lot of times now before I actually like turn on the radio. So, you know, we're really excited to have a new way to share with you guys the way, you know, the information about the cases that we're learning and give families another avenue to also be able to raise awareness about these cases and the victims and you know, who they were, what happened, and what the family, you know, is going through, and hopefully get some answers. And, you know, we encourage anybody who has information, even if you just think you have information, get it in. I think that's kind of our mantra at this point. If you know something, say something. Absolutely, because it may not seem like a big deal to you, but To an investigator who has all of these puzzle pieces that they're trying to put together, it may be that piece that they're missing. So even if you don't think that it's necessarily relevant, send it in. And a lot of these places have ways that you can send in information now that's anonymous. So you don't even have to put your actual personal information with it. Um, A lot of times we try to, when we link the cases and put the case cards up on the social media pages, we try to provide that link to submit the anonymous information. So, you know, if you haven't followed us on social media yet, we've got a link in the description. So go do that. And, you know, we'll always let you know who you can contact if you do have information at the end of the episode. And it'll also be in the description as well. That's right. I think with that, we can go ahead and get into the first episode. If listening to Unforgotten has inspired you to create your own podcast, you're in luck. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can make your own podcast and share it with the world. And the Spotify platform makes it super easy to get started. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. 
So no matter where you are when an idea hits, you're ready to start recording. Spotify for podcasters makes it easy to distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Plus, you can do video podcasts and engage with fans through Q&A and polls. You can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's free. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters and sign up for your free account to start recording and sharing your podcast with the world. So today we're discussing the disappearance of Mobile County teen Brittany Wood. Brittany was last seen leaving her mother's home in Tillman's Corner on May 30th, 2012, around 7.20 p.m. She is believed to have been wearing a blue tank top, blue jean shorts, and flip-flops, and carrying a blue or pink tote with some personal items. Now, one thing that continuously pops up during discussions of Brittany's disappearance is a docu-series that Peacock released in August of 2021, titled Monster in the Shadows. Yes, uh, there seems to be mixed opinions on that, though. The series uh, featured Brittany's mother, Chessie Wood, and other members of Brittany's family, It discusses Brittany's disappearance along with the shocking and disturbing events that unfolded afterwards. While the series does provide a good general outline for what occurred, there does seem to be a few inconsistencies or conflicts in what we found when we were researching. So maybe let's start with a little bit of a background on Brittany. So Brittany was a young single mom. She had a somewhat tumultuous relationship with Andy, who is the father of her child. In fact, most of Brittany's life seemed to be filled with some sort of conflict. At an early age, she was molested by her maternal grandmother's boyfriend and later testified against him in court proceedings related to child sex abuse, which ultimately landed him in prison for life. Sadly, he was just the tip of the iceberg, and we'll discuss more in a moment. Once in her teens, Brittany was described as somewhat of a free spirit, regularly bouncing from one relative's home to another, which apparently wasn't always a good thing, as Chessie would later say in hindsight that her children, quote, would have been safer in a crack house, unquote. Wow. I know. Despite the environment she was raised in, or maybe because of that environment, Brittany built up a tough exterior. Her family and friends describe her as a fighter and someone who never wanted to see those she loved hurt. And those traits, actually, Chessie said, could have contributed to Brittany's disappearance. And that seems like a possibility. For those who don't already know, shortly after Brittany's disappearance, law enforcement agencies in Mobile and Baldwin counties began making a series of arrests related to a child abuse investigation that began in early 2012. The investigation resulted in the arrest of the following individuals, Dustin Kent, Scott Wood, Derek Wood, Donald Paul Holland Jr., who they call Paul, Billy Brownlee, Wendy Holland, Chessie Wood, Mendy Kent, Nelton, who they call Butch, Morgan, James Kumba, and Jennifer Moore. And while we want this episode to focus primarily on Brittany, you can't discuss her disappearance without addressing this investigation, at least briefly, because they may very likely be connected. So to keep the focus on Brittany, we will provide a link in the description to an AL.com article outlining the details and charges for each arrest. In 2014, Baldwin County Prosecutor Teresa Hines told AP that, quote, Brittany could have been huge. She could have corroborated so many things. Former Baldwin County Detective Eric Winberg even went so far as to call her a golden nugget. We oftentimes look for that golden nugget, that that one person that can make the difference in your case. In this particular case, Brittany Wood was that person. She was the person that could tell the whole story. So it seems like there's plenty of reason to believe that some of those arrested, and obviously there were plenty of people that were arrested, that would have wanted to keep Brittany quiet. But before we get into the details of Brittany's disappearance, let's go over a little bit of her family tree. 
Yeah, that will probably be helpful because there's quite a few people referenced and it's really hard to keep track of who is who. Brittany's mother is Chessie Wood and Chessie's married to Paul Houseconnect. Brittany's father is Wally Hankey and he is married to Stephanie Hankey. Brittany also has two brothers, Derek and TJ Wood. It seems like Brittany spent quite a bit of time with Chessie's family, and their names will come up a bit later on. Chessie had several siblings, a sister named Sonia, twin sisters named Mindy and Wendy, and a brother named Scott. Wendy was married to Donnie Holland, and Mindy was married to Dustin Kent. And you might recognize some of those names from the list we just gave of those arrested related to the child sex abuse investigation. It's important to remember that Brittany grew up with and was around most of those individuals, obviously pretty often, and really did potentially have a lot of information relative to the investigation. Just a few days prior to her disappearance, Brittany received a Facebook message from Donnie and Wendy's daughter. Since Donnie and Wendy's daughter's name has never been released, we're not going to mention it here, but we will read the messages. So I'll read Brittany's messages And Stormy, why don't you read the messages from Donnie and Wendy's daughter? Sure, will do. Keep in mind that people don't often write the way they speak, um, but we're going to do our best to read it as close to verbatim as possible. Hey, cuz, what's up? Hey, beautiful. How are you? Tell me what's going on. I don't know what's true and what you said. I told on daddy for what he'd done to me. What did he do? I want to know, like, how it happened, who else did. Scott, Dustin, and they raped me. Scott did too? And Dustin? OMG. Somebody said some about Billy, and you said Paul. IDK, who all was it? Where it happened? I'm so sorry. Out the house, Mimi's. It was Dustin, Donnie, and Scott. Where was everybody else? I'm sorry, I just want to know. When they wasn't at home or gone. I love you. I'm sorry. And they did it all at the same time? Love you too. It doesn't appear that Brittany ever got a response to that last question. But the messages between Brittany and her cousin took place on May 27th. Her cousin messaged her again on May 28th and 30th. However, Brittany never responded after May 27th. In the interviews with the media and later in the docuseries, Chessie states she believes these messages angered Brittany and potentially pushed her to confront Donnie about what happened. Um, But unfortunately, that's something we'll never know because Donnie was discovered on June 1st with an alleged self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head and he was never able to disclose what happened to Brittany after he picked her up on the 30th. We were fortunate enough to also obtain copies of Brittany's cell phone records, along with Donnie's, and records from some of the agencies involved. And you know, we've been looking at it for some time, and every time we think we have a handle on it, we find something new that we just miss the first time. I know. I mean... I think um, we followed the uncovered case visualization while watching the docuseries, and it helped in some ways, but it just added way more questions in other ways. Yeah. And that visualization is pretty detailed, so it makes it easy to follow along. Right. Since we're not experts with cell phone data and location data, we did ask Michael Fleming of Echo 7 Foxtrot and Secrets True Crime to help us sort through it and make sure that we knew what we were looking at and we were looking at the right things. With that being said, the cell phone location data gives us a pretty good idea of the general location of Brittany and or Donnie. And based on other research, we can make an educated guess about the specific location. Fortunately, we've been provided with a pretty good amount of documentation, which definitely helps limit the amount of educated guessing that we're doing. So let's get down to what we know about the day of Brittany's disappearance. So according to her cell phone records, Brittany did not start off May 30th at Chessie's home. We're not exactly sure where she started, but we've been given a couple of ideas to follow up on based on the general area her phone pinged. 
there is a cell phone tower at the end of Leonard Drive, which is the same street Chessie's home was on at the time. Brittany's phone began pinging off that tower at 11.41 a.m., so we're assuming that's when she made it back to Chessie's. And just to be clear, we're going to be throwing out a lot of times throughout this episode, so anybody who's interested in kind of following along with those times, if you want to check out the Uncovered visualization, we'll provide a link to that in the details for the episode. It doesn't appear that Chessie was home, at least when Brittany got there, because Brittany made several phone calls to her. Brittany's first call to Donnie was at 11.58 a.m., and she had a few additional calls to Donnie over the course of the afternoon and into the evening, with the last call occurring at 7.19 p.m. Brittany stayed pretty active on her phone with calls and texts throughout the day, you know, talking to different friends. Um, So there were other communications in that time period. Sounds just like a teenager. Yep, exactly what you would expect. I just point out the calls with Donnie because we now know that Donnie picked her up and that helps establish what time she would have left Chessie's home. Right. In episode one of the docuseries, Chessie said Brittany left around 7 p.m. telling her that she was going to see a good friend named Courtney. Chessie recalled standing in her front yard as Brittany walked down the street to meet whoever picked her up. She said there were trees and a fence that obscured her view of Brittany the further she got down the road, so she had no idea who um, picked Brittany up at the time. Chessie further commented in the series Brittany's demeanor had changed and she was, quote, aggravated or frustrated with something, unquote. Well, we know from the cell phone records it was later than seven because it wouldn't really make sense that Donnie and Brittany would have been calling each other when they were together. Although I'm not particularly sure it really matters whether it was 7 or 7.30 at this point anyway, because any video that investigators could have obtained, you know, is either going to cover that period or it's not. And it's not like they're going to be able to go back and get additional video at this point. Right. But, you know, it's just worth noting it to help further narrow that timeline a little bit. But yeah, that helps. That helps a lot, I think. The comment though that did strike me as odd was the one about Brittany's demeanor. Because Chessie did an interview with Fox 10 in June of 2012 and said that Brittany was quote happy as she could be. She wasn't upset at all. You know One thing we talk a lot about is that people's memories tend to fade over time. So I tend to rely on statements made closer in time to an event happening because that memory's fresh. But here, Chessie's put Brittany's demeanor on the complete opposite ends of the spectrum. And it's hard to really judge what mood Brittany was actually in when she left. That's exactly right. I mean, if she was as happy as can be, that seems to be in conflict with the idea that she was frustrated and going to confront Donnie. I mean, I guess if Brittany was going to confront Donnie and didn't want anybody to stop her, then maybe being in a better mood when she said she was going to her friends, like it would lead to less questions or something. But the confusing part is why the drastic shift in her mood all of a sudden? Chessie says in the series, she vividly remembers that day. But what does that mean? The details from the beginning weren't vivid? And if that's the case, were those details also inaccurate? I mean, there was a lot going on at that point in time, but that's a pretty stark difference in how Brittany left. And maybe that seems like something small, but small things turn into big things. As an aside, Most things describe Brittany as carrying a teal or pink tote bag on the evening of May 30th, but in that same interview with Fox 10, it stated that Brittany was carrying a blue bag. There's no mention of a pink bag, and what significance that holds, I don't know, but it's worth mentioning. Another thing to point out in that first episode of the series is that Eric Winberg, a former Baldwin County Sheriff's Office detective who initially led the investigation, said it was his belief that Donnie picked Brittany up at the end of Leonard Drive in Mobile County and then went to Sticks River in the Wilcox area. I'm not sure the map that's shown at that point actually shows the correct location of the house where Donnie was staying. 
Yeah, let's talk about that real quick. The property that Winberg talked about is located on Waterworld Road near Sticks River in Baldwin County. I think it's actually um, in the city of Robertsdale, which is kind of just outside of Loxley for people who are familiar with the area. That property was owned by one of the Holland's friends, Jennifer Gonzalez Moore. So it wasn't actually Donnie and Wendy's, you know, residential family home. Right. Donnie and Wendy actually shared a home on Bay Street in Fairhope, uh, which is about 30, 35 minutes away from the Sticks River property. Our understanding is Donnie was given permission to stay at the Sticks River property because he was not supposed to be around any children, including his own, due to the pending child sex abuse investigation. So, And we'll stick a pin in that because there's a lot to unpack with Donnie, and I think that's probably a recurring statement that we'll make. You bet it is. (laughs) So... Chessie says that the Sticks River property is the last place the neighbor saw or heard Brittany. But according to AL.com, Baldwin County Sheriff's Office, which we'll call BCSO for short, was never able to identify any individual who could place Brittany in Baldwin County. Whether or not there were witnesses, cell phone data puts Brittany in that area. So we know she was there. We just don't know for certain whether anyone actually saw her. And there's a lot of cell phone activity for Brittany in that area, as we kind of stated before. Actually, there's a lot of cell phone activity for Brittany most of the May 30th, so we have a pretty good idea where she was and when. Her records indicate she arrived at the Sticks River property around 8.25 p.m. Just looking at her records, it appears Brittany was actively communicating with her friends via text from the time Donnie picked her up around 7.20-ish until, oh, about 10.46 p.m., it looks like, and then it suddenly stops. At that point, there's no incoming or outgoing texts until about 11.20 p.m. Brittany or someone using Brittany's phone sends a text to Andy then at 11.20 p.m., and a text to Bradley Rivers then at 11.23 p.m. So Andy, you know, as we said, that's the father of her child. And then Bradley is just a friend of hers, we assume, that she had been talking to throughout that evening. But it's really strange to see that constant flow of text going and coming all evening, and then that gap of nothing. I mean, were none of those people she'd been communicating with that evening, sending her messages either. Was her phone off? I mean, there were no phone calls after Donnie picked her up. So I guess it's not that odd that there were no phone calls during that period, but there weren't even incoming texts. Yeah, it's very strange. And to make it even stranger, after those two texts were sent, Brittany starts receiving phone calls from Andy. Um, From 11.29 to 11.45 p.m., 14 calls are received. Obviously, the first call isn't answered because Andy immediately called back. But then from the second call on, the calls go straight to voicemail. And there's actually what looks to be two voicemail notification texts received among those calls, one at 11.37 and one at 11.40 p.m. So Andy was definitely leaving voicemails when he was calling. Which is probably why the next time Brittany's phone was used, it was to check her voicemail at 12.07 a.m. That would be May 31st now. So we have Brittany actively sending and receiving messages until 10.46 p.m. Then there's nothing. Then two messages are sent from her phone at 11.20 and 11.23 a flurry of unanswered incoming calls from 11.29 to 11.45 p.m. And then Brittany's voicemail is checked by her or somebody at 12.07 a.m. Right. And that call to her voicemail at 12.07 a.m. indicates she was still at or at least near the Sticks River property. There's no activity whatsoever on her phone again until 1.47 a.m. when a text is sent from her phone to Bradley. That text caused her phone to ping off of a tower in Grand Bay. Now, I'm not sure the map on the docuseries here has the correct location of her cell phone ping in Sticks River, but that's hard to tell. 
And then that's the last time anything was sent from Brittany's phone. Which has never been recovered. Which is weird because we have all of this other information from her phone. Right. In the series, they have a phone expert who says that Brittany's phone is used to communicate with several numbers between 11 and 1140. And that's why the text to Bradley at 147 a.m. probably wasn't a repeat text. But just to cover that, it was the idea of a repeat text was because law enforcement had apparently decided that the text to Bradley earlier at 11 23 maybe got hung up or something and recent at 147 except there's no communication between 10:46 p.m. and 11:20 p.m. which is when the next text to Andy goes out but we don't have the context of the outgoing text and we aren't experts so i don't think we can definitively say whether it was a repeat text or not and supposedly Bradley was interviewed by law enforcement and he talked to the family but he couldn't recall what the content of the messages were, which is odd because they had a pretty extensive conversation. Right. Um, he's also since passed away, so there's really no way for us to know. But maybe that information is something that law enforcement has, and they're just keeping that close to the vest. It could be, yeah. Donnie's records and his cell phone pings did help fill in some of the gaps of where they were during certain points of the evening, assuming Brittany and or her phone were always with him. True. From what we can tell, Donnie arrived at the Sticks River property around 8.21 p.m., which is around the same time Brittany's records show she arrived. He had less activity that evening, however, And according to his records, he was actively communicating with people until about 8.36 p.m., which was when he received a call from Wendy, and they spoke for about 10 minutes. There's a gap where there's no activity, and then about an hour later, at 9.31, he received another call from Wendy, and they spoke for almost 15 minutes. Then there's another gap with no activity. And an hour later, he's at 10.33, Donnie called Wendy, and they spoke for a little over 15 minutes. His cell phone data indicates that he was at or near the Sticks River property when these calls were made. And shortly after that last phone call is when Brittany stops communicating with people. At 1227 a.m., Donnie began actively communicating again, but he's no longer at the Sticks River property, and it appears he's now traveling. Whew, that's a lot. (laughs) That's a lot to absorb there. Well, looking at the Google Maps, comparing his location data to Brittany's, he would have left the Sticks River property around the time Brittany's voicemail was checked in order to have made it to where his phone pinged at 1227. So all this to say we can assume Brittany and or her phone were with Donnie at that point because he ends up back over near Chessie's home on Leonard Drive in Mobile County. And that's not to say he was at Chessie's, though, since Mindy and Dustin also lived in that general area and possibly some friends of the Hollands. Right. Now, there's a couple of interesting things here in Donnie's call when you take the docuseries into account. So Donnie's last call while he's around the Sticks River property is to Wendy at 10.33 p.m., after which there's about a two-hour period where there's no activity on his phone. Then at 12.27 a.m., Donnie begins texting and appears to be traveling back to Mobile. Wendy calls Donnie at 12.30. He receives three texts at 1.08, at which point he's arrived back in the area of Leonard Drive. And then Donnie calls Wendy at 1.28 a.m. It doesn't appear he responded to the last three texts, and he was still in that Leonard Drive area when he called Wendy at 1.28. After 1.28, there's no further activity or location data for Donnie until 8.28 a.m., which puts him back in the Sticks River property. So at this point, we're now into May 31st. Like the early morning. (laughs) Do you feel a little bit like a yo-yo after all that? Yes. (laughs) Winberg also stated in the series that Wendy's cell phone records indicated that she went to Sticks River at some point during the night of May 30th, 
But whether that was just a visitor husband or to clean up a crime scene, he didn't know. He didn't put a time on it when that occurred. But considering he said to visit her husband, we can assume that meant she was there at the same time Donnie was, which really only leaves after 1030, but before 1227, since we know Donnie was on the move at that point. And we assume that Wendy was back at their Fairhope home by at least 142-ish a.m., because she made a post on Facebook about not being able to sleep due to one of their kids having a fever. And the location that was listed on the post was Turkey Branch, which is a community name, I suppose, for where their Bay Street house was in Fairhope. It's possible she spoofed it, but it seems like extra work when your phone data is just going to give you away anyway. Guys, just remember, you can delete posts and comments, but screenshots live on for it. Ever. Preach, sister. <laughs> so if you're involved in something even slightly sketchy, somewhere someone is just nosy. I mean, curious enough to share it. Always. Maybe if some of the investigating agencies listen to this, they'll be kind enough to send us copies of Wendy's phone records or actually any other cell phone records they have so we can fill in some of these gaps. Ooh, I like how you slip that request in so we don't have to ask for something else. Just trying to multitask. So, 19 minutes after Donnie makes the call to Wendy at 1.28 a.m., Brittany's phone pings off a Grand Bay Tower. Our understanding is that ping came from a tower at the TA travel station just off exit 4, which, according to Google, is 15 minutes away from Leonard Drive, if one were to take the interstate, or 19 minutes if one were to take old Pascagoula Road. The timing seems awfully convenient, considering there was no further activity on Donnie's phone after that call to Wendy at 128. You know, at least until 828 in the morning when he was back over in the Sticks River property at that point. So just to recap, we've got Brittany's voicemail being checked at 12.07 in the morning at the Sticks River property. Then the next location data we have between either of the cell phone records is at, you know, 12.27-ish, which is when Donnie's phone pings and lets us know that he is now on the road. Then Donnie's phone pings over in the Mobile County area. And 19 minutes after Donnie talks to Wendy at 128, Brittany's phone pings for the last time in Grand Bay. It's possible that Donnie used a different phone to communicate since Baldwin County Sheriff's Office records indicate several phones were recovered in Donnie's SUV. But it doesn't make sense that he'd use his regular cell phone all evening and then swap. However, he obviously traveled back to Sticks River at some point. Yeah, we've talked about that before, where we wondered if he may have had a second phone. But you're right, it really is kind of um, inconvenient and maybe not as likely that he would just be swapping phones back and yeah. forth. Yeah. yeah. Well, another thing I thought was interesting was the time it took Donnie and Brittany to travel from Mobile to Baldwin County. According to Google, it takes 41 minutes to drive from Leonard Drive to Sticks River, but it took Donnie and Brittany about 60 minutes to travel there and about the same amount of time for Donnie to travel back, if we assume he left around the time Brittany's voicemail was last checked. And just looking at their cell phone pings, it looks like Brittany and Donnie maybe took a short detour once they reached Baldwin County. So just speculating, perhaps they stopped at a gas station or somewhere along the way, which would account for the additional time. But it appears that Donnie went straight back to Mobile. So if nothing else, he wasn't in a hurry? Yeah. Hmm. Well, although there is that 38-minute window during Donnie's drive back to Mobile where there is no activity or location information for him, and that's between 12.30 a.m. and 1.08 a.m. So it's possible he could have arrived back in the Mobile area a little sooner or stopped somewhere along the way, but that's also just a guess. 
Yeah, and it's hard to imagine there'd be a lot of traffic on the road during those hours. I mean, that area, the road that they would have had to have traveled, you know, there's the Bayway right there that connects Mobile County and Baldwin County, if you're not familiar with the area. And Baldwin County is kind of a tourist destination, I guess, because that's how you get to the beaches on the Gulf. And, you know, Stormy pointed out when we were talking about this that it was a holiday weekend. So you would expect there to be some travel and that area is known to get backed up during holidays and summer. But we're talking about midnight and early morning hours. So you wouldn't think there'd be a whole lot of traffic there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so either. Maybe, you know, on their way over, I could kind of see that. But on Donnie's way back, not so much. So in the grand scheme, an additional 20 minutes of travel time seems like quite a bit. And maybe that's just me. Hmm. So supposedly, no one knows why he came back to Mobile to begin with. A logical assumption would be that he was taking Brittany back to Chessie's, but she left with a tote bag. So the contents of that bag have never been confirmed. But according to the Charlie Project, there was a curling iron, extra clothes, and makeup, which seems to indicate that she was going to stay overnight wherever she was headed. And then her phone pings in Grand Bay after Donnie's phone pings around the Leonard Drive area, which is where Brittany would have been if she'd been dropped off at Chessie's. So, you know, just a random thought. If Brittany had said she was going to visit this friend because she didn't want anybody to know where she was actually going, maybe this bag did have these things to make it appear she was going somewhere overnight. I mean, we don't know because the bag's never been recovered. So we don't know what was in it. I get, I'm not sure where Charlie Project got that from. Um, But just a thought, because I mean, you're right. If that's what was in the bag, that it does sound like she was planning on staying overnight somewhere. Good point though. You know, if maybe it was Chessie that, saw what the contents were and she was trying to fool Chessie into thinking that's where she was going was to her girlfriends. But I don't know if she always carried that bag with her, you know, or a bag like it with her when she was traveling, you know, we know that she did kind of, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, house hop. So, <laughs> um, yeah. so it's possible that could be a normal routine thing for her to do, but it also, maybe you're right. Maybe it could be to make it look like she was going somewhere that she wasn't. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. In the docu series, Chessie also made a comment that she thought Donnie maybe went to Mindy and Dustin's when he got back to Mobile. It looks like their house was only about 0.2 miles away from Chessie's at the time. So not far. Not far at all. But to my knowledge, no one, including Mindy and Dustin, has ever admitted to Donnie coming to their house that evening. But no one, including Mindy and Dustin, has ever claimed to have any knowledge about what happened to Brittany either. To further complicate the matter, the one person who should have knowledge, Donnie Holland, was found on June 1st with an alleged self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. We know this is a lot to take in, so let's hit the high notes. Donnie picked up Brittany at the end of Leonard Drive on May 30th around 7.20 p.m., and the two traveled from Tillman's Corner to the Moore property on Waterworld Road near Styx River. Once at the Styx River property, Brittany was actively texting with various friends throughout the evening until approximately 10.45 p.m., when all incoming and outgoing communications stopped for about 40 or 45 minutes. Then Brittany or someone using her phone sends two texts. Within minutes of those texts being sent, there's a series of unanswered incoming calls. At 12.07 a.m., Brittany, or someone using her phone, checks her voicemail. About 20 minutes after Brittany's voicemail is checked, Donnie is traveling back to Mobile County. At 1.47 a.m., an outgoing text is sent from Brittany's phone to Bradley, causing her phone to ping off a tower at Exit 4 in Grand Bay. It's unknown whether the text was a repeat of the earlier text 
and it's unknown whether Brittany was physically with her phone. What is known is that is the last time anything was ever sent from Brittany's phone, and it is the last time her phone pinged off any tower. In the next episode, we'll be discussing the days following Brittany's disappearance, including some things we found interesting about Donnie's death and an Escambia County medical examiner's narrative that we haven't seen or heard talked about before, and where Brittany's case seems to stand today. And if you thought there was a lot in this episode, just hang tight as we continue searching for answers to the question, where is Brittany Wood? Disappearance of Brittany Wood. Missing Brittany. teenager. It's been Brittany four Wood. long months since yeah. Brittany Wood with was of Where, is Brittany, Where Wood? is Brittany Wood? Where is Brittany Wood? Where is Brittany Wood? If you or someone you know has any information on the disappearance of Brittany Wood, we urge you to contact the Mobile Police Department at 251-208-7211. You may also message us here at the ACCA via email or by messenger at our Facebook page. Unforgotten is an Alabama cold case advocacy podcast recorded in conjunction with Riverside FM, hosted and distributed by Anchor FM, available on your favorite podcast platform. Intro music for the show was created by Principles of Uncertainty, who also mixed and mastered this episode. Content and production is by Sellers and Stormy, artwork by Sellers. Credits for music, sound clips, special mentions, and any source referenced in our podcast can be found in each episode's description. We hope you will join us on all the major social media sites and continue to raise awareness of our Alabama cold cases. Until next time, thank you for listening to Unforgotten.